What is up, diehards? Wes Monell, Andrew LaQuesta in the building for AWOL Sports. Thanks for hanging out with us. We're going to talk about stock up and stock down today after a month of football. Look, man, I have three stock up, three stock down, as do you. And I'll preface it with this. Just because you know me, I think you'd guess my three stock up. And I think you'd be a little disappointed with one of my stock down. So I'll save that one for last. Uh, Before we dive into those, man, do you think any of yours are going to surprise me? Um, I think one of them would pretty would be on your radar. Uh, we we've we've kind of mentioned this topic a couple times. Um, yeah, I would say I would say pretty even. I'd say there's three that might be surprising, and there's three that would be kind of on your radar. Sweet, sounds good to me, man. Good recipe for success. Let's hit it. I'll go first. Stock up. Cleveland Browns, a team I had in the postseason this year. The dog pound is three and one after dismantling the Cowboys. That was one test for them. Indianapolis and Pittsburgh, there'll be more tests coming up in the next few weeks, especially after losing Nick Chubb to a knee injury. But for now, their only loss against the Ravens, it was a bad one. It's understandable if Their wins over Cincinnati and Washington don't make you a believer. But I propose this. They won the games they needed to win in the first month of football. They bounced back mentally from a week one blowout loss. Those are the steps in the right direction for any team. Baker Mayfield, two touchdowns in each of the last three games, only one pick in those three wins. Odell Beckham, Heavily involved against Dallas, a former rival of his, as expected. I thought he was going to have a big game, not just because I have him on one of my fantasy rosters. You can just see it coming. The writing was on the wall. It came to fruition. He had the hat trick, three TDs, sealed the deal with one of those. With last week being their biggest win of this young season, we get to see how they follow up against another 3 and one team in the Colts. I think that's another victory. After four games, I'm feeling good about the Cleveland Browns making a postseason run. I'm feeling good. Stock up for the dog pound. What's your first one on the list? Yeah, I mean, it's a little painful because I kind of half agree with that. didn't think the Browns would be near performing this well. I will kind of touch on their quality of wins a little bit later, but um, that Colts is going to be a real test. I mean, Colts, one of the best rushing defenses in the NFL. Um, I think they're the number one rushing defense just because their yards per carry is also legit. Um, So a little bit skewed numbers when you look at rushing yards. Sometimes it's just the attempts that other teams lack, but yards per carry is definitely a big uh, statement there for the Colts. So I think that'll be one of the biggest tests for the Browns. Um, But we'll see, man. Uh, I I like what they're doing. So I agree with you. I like what they're doing. They're game managing um, their quarterback, which they should. And they're just running the rock, man. Even with Nick Chubb out, they they definitely were performing and edging the Cowboys. Just Cowboys just couldn't stop it. So uh, I think that's definitely a fault for the Cowboys also. But uh, one of the teams I had on the rise uh, that I think will be on your radar was a rising stock for Brian Flores and the Miami, Miami Dolphins. And I know people look at the schedule um, and look at the lack of wins, but I mean, at least we know this team is trending in the right direction. So obviously a lot of those Miami games aren't really on national television, but I mean, you look at the games that they've had so far versus new England week one, uh, that's a tough team to prepare against. It's a new offense, new quarterback. We're not really going to, we don't know how they're going to come out and, and run the offense. So, I mean, they're on the road, Ryan Fitzpatrick, two weeks removed from the loss of his mom. Uh, the Dolphins were only down three points with five minutes left in that game. So pretty solid performance there. You move on to week two versus Buffalo, one of the top defenses. I mean, he went, Fitzpatrick went toe to toe. Josh Allen, one of the hottest quarterbacks, if not the hottest quarterback so far this year, put up 28 points on a defense that has been very stingy since the start of last year. So pretty tough to score on. Only lost that game by three points. You move on to Jacksonville. 
Minshew was having a fantastic statistical start to the season, and so was undrafted rookie running back James Robinson. Miami contained Minshew to the lowest amount of rush attempts so far this year, and his uh, lowest rush average or uh, rush total too. Um, even forced a fumble off of him also. They brought the pressure, four sacks in that game, 10 quarterback hits, zero touchdowns from Minshew. Uh, along with that, they held Robinson to only uh, five carries less than his average this year, his lowest rush yard total, and um, took him out of the game sometimes, running some of their backup running backs in, in shotgun situations. So um, they took the lead early against Jacksonville. Uh, they were up by 14 twice in the first half. They were up by 21 by the time you hit the third quarter, and they just coasted from there, even against Seattle last year. I mean, Seattle last year, Tyler Lockett and Russell Wilson, the past three years, they've had an 80% catch rate. That's one of the best in the NFL. This year, they were on pace already for an 86% catch rate. Those two, Miami, that game brought it all the way down to 50%. The team was only minus eight in the first half, and they were even in the second half. So great adjustments. What I'm getting at is the quality. I think we're seeing a trend here. Brian Flores is obviously a product from the Bill Belichick regime, kind of doing some Bill Belichick things. Those first few games, taking away what that offense is comfortable with. So I like where the Dolphins are going, even though the win column isn't exactly where you would want it. As a Dolphins fan, I think – in Miami, in the 305, if you're watching those games, I think you'd have to come out pretty happy with those. 100% agree. I was just talking to our buddy Paul about this before we came on air here, and I had a feeling you were going to bring up Miami. We both like Brian Flores, and for good reason. I, he asked me, when do we see Tua? My, my short answer was, look, Fitzpatrick, just like you mentioned, Played the Patriots, the Bills, the Jags, and the Seahawks. The only game you expected Miami to be in or win, they did against the Jags as you just went through. So they weren't supposed to win the other three games against substantially better teams. Just a tough schedule to start. Smart to go with Fitzpatrick at the beginning of the season, even though they didn't really have a choice. I like what they're doing, man. Miles Gaskin coming through. Devontae Parker, as Paul brought up to me. The most receiving yards dating back to week seven last season. Balling out of control, man. I like the pieces in Miami. We liked them building last year, and I don't think that's changing for either one of us this year. And let's stick to the Sunshine State. My number two stock up, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Maybe it's a stock up for a lot of you listeners out there, and maybe a lot of you just aren't sold. I mean – a lot of people just not on the Tom Brady and the Buccaneers bandwagon. I heard more, more of you against it than for it. So I'm, I'm beating the drum for Tom Brady every single week until he shows me not to. We've seen them win offensively and defensively now. The one thing we won't see until the second half of the season, Tom Brady throwing to Mike Evans and Chris Godwin from start to finish in a single game. That hasn't happened yet. It just hasn't. So who doesn't like a team that can't find different ways to win as they have? They'll get a rematch at the Saints later in the year who they have two more wins than right now heading into week five. Two games is a big lead. I know Tom Brady has a couple pick sixes early on. A little unusual. That can be corrected. If you saw those passes, that can be corrected. I expect that to come to an end. The Saints game. It was a one-possession result, win or lose, without that pick. Uh, and that was with Michael Thomas. They didn't avoid playing Michael Thomas. The next week, they didn't avoid playing Christian McCaffrey. He rolled his ankle late in that game, but that was after just 22nd touch of the game. So CMC was there. And the defense that game, two picks, five sacks, nine and a half tackles for a loss. And that was the same game. Leonard Fournette pounded the rock in the second half and route to 100 yards. So that was another way that they won a game. Then they handled the Broncos like they should. I won't dive in too far into that one. Kind of obvious on the surface. But last week against the Chargers, challenged. Tom Brady was challenged just like Pat Mahomes was the week before. But he racked up 369 and five touchdowns. 
not quite as many rings on his finger, but five's pretty nice. Five's a good day. And look, that Charger defense, they held Mahomes under 200 yards twice last season. We talked about that a couple weeks ago, Drew. And look, in that game against the Chargers, the other running back, Ronald Jones, runs for, runs for triple digits. Mike Evans goes up against Casey Hayward. He hits a century mark and a pair of scores. He's got a score in every game so far this year. It's what I expected out of Mike Evans. It's why I wanted him in fantasy. I didn't land him. It, it just kind of falls that way sometimes. Tampa Bay, though, they're learning to gel. I'm interested in this offense, how it does against the Bears in week six, and how the defense fares against the Packers. Actually, they play the Bears this week, week five. I want to see how the offense does. And then the following week, I want to see how their defense does against Aaron Rodgers, who's hot, and the Packers coming off a bye, man. What do you think of Tampa? Yeah, I definitely agree there. I, I mean, obviously with the new offense, you can expect some mistakes. You know, a lot of the times we get a lot – we get too emotional with it. You know, we, we hey, it's Tom Brady. We see the rings. We see the progress. And we don't even give them a chance to go through the motions and go through – uh, the heartaches. It's, I mean, super short season, off season, and brand new team. Very new. I mean, you can expect some of these bumps. I mean, you look at the pick six against New Orleans. Nobody thought New Orleans was a trashy defense. That's a great defense. And Janoris Jenkins, if you know your football, Janoris Jenkins is going to go down as one of the upper echelon DBs to get pick sixes. That's just that's just the nature of his game. So you could expect to play from him. You could expect to play from one of the best secondaries in the league like that, another pick six against the Chargers, so not too surprising. I mean, it's it's not something that we're going to be seeing a lot from Tom Brady. So uh, the fact that he pulled that off, 370 yards and five touchdowns, um, I saw that almost every snap because I watched him rack up all those points on my fantasy bench. So, ouch. Um, hey, you win some, you lose some. But you're right, man. Uh, Tom Brady, we've seen what he can do, especially with a Super Bowl caliber winning defense. And this defense is primed, again, one of the best linebacker, linebacking cores in the NFL. I think they are the best duo, Levante David and Devin White. Devin White, in his second year, only looking like an all-star perennial pro bowler to come. Uh, so I like that. I definitely like everything kind of meshing together. I think people hit the panic button a little bit too early in weeks one and two. So I think uh, definitely the bucks are on the rise. Um, something that I had uh, for a rising stock is coach Matt Eberflus from the Indianapolis Colts. Mm -hmm. Now he was with the Cowboys for a while and we never really thought the Cowboys offense to be a weakness ever. Mike Nolan, who really hasn't had a notable stint as a D coordinator, let alone, a position coach in the past 14 years. I mean, besides the two years he had in Baltimore in 2003 and 2004 with arguably some of the best rosters defensively that we've ever seen, his defenses were bottom 12 or worse. So not really a resume there. Not really sure why they went with Mike Nolan defensively. Just a lack of continuity, I think, on that offensive staff as well, bringing in um, that coach, someone else to run the offense. It doesn't look like it's clicking totally. I think they're running a completely different offense. Obviously, we know that they can put up the pass yards and the points, but they're just getting beat defensively, and it doesn't look like scoring quick is helping them. They're playing catch-up football. I don't know. I mean, Matt Everfuss was under their nose for seven years, and they let him go. I mean, the Colts in 2019, the Colts' defense was pretty mediocre. Ever since he's been there in 2018, though, They've improved a little bit each way. And now in 2020, they're one of the best defenses. I think the best defense so far in the first quarter of the, of the year. Um, they shined last year against the run. And that was pretty much it this year. They're doing even better. I don't know how many stats they're in the top five, but a crazy, crazy improvement this year. They're the number one overall defense. They're number one against the pass. And a lot of those stats against the pass are a little bit inflated. You could say, oh, this team's really good. They're, they're letting out the least amount of pass yards. But in reality, the run defense is shitty. So what I see against the Colts is that they're number five stopping or slowing down completion percentage for quarterbacks. And they actually have the worst 
offensive quarterback pass rating. So quarterbacks hate playing the Colts. They have the worst rating in the league playing against this defense. So that shows it's not just a stat fluffer. They're actually playing good pass defense. Number four against the run. Number three against yards per carry. They're the best team in points allowed defensively. And they're number three in the turnover differential. So great on third downs defensively. Uh, They don't give up the big play. Um, DeForest Buckner, that's showing that that gamble, that trade for the number one pick is definitely benefiting them. He's the number two rated interior lineman on PFF. Xavier Rhodes is making plays. They're getting to the pass rush. I mean, besides the Jets, you had Jacksonville. Jacksonville, was, they're not a pushover team. They're giving teams fits. All right, that was a loss, but then they face Minnesota. Minnesota's still talented. They can definitely put up points every week. They're number eight in rushing. They're number five in yards per play. They took out Minnesota convincingly, took out Chicago convincingly. Chicago was undefeated. That team was number six on third downs offensively, and they were 11th in rushing. So they're not a pushover team, obviously undefeated. Um a little hiccup there from Nick Foles. I think he'll bounce back. But as far as the situation of Chicago coming off a high off of their three straight wins, um, they controlled that game. So out of four games played, this defense has played 16 quarters. Eight of those quarters were shutouts. I think Indianapolis Colts are for real on defense. Good stuff. Shedding the light on that. I, I think they're a good defense. I have to see them. I have to see them play against some tougher competition, to be honest. Uh, I, I would compare your stock up of the Colts to, to be similar to my stock up of the Browns. They did what they were supposed to do in the first month of football. They played who was on their schedule. I, I just can't – I can't be as high on the Colts' defense like that, even though he's a he's probably a head coach candidate. Uh, he's going to be up there. I'm just not sold on the Jaguars' offense – the Vikings offense, the Jets offense, or the Bears offense. But that's who was on the slate, and that's what you showed me that you understood with my Browns take was, hey, through a month, through four games, this is what they did. So at this point in time, that stock is up, and you're absolutely right. I hear you there. There's no disagreement with that whatsoever. My number three stock, that is up. Wide receiver, DK Metcalf. You know, this is one of my favorites. I was ultra high on this guy. I had him in fantasy last season, rewatched his 2019. He had a very productive rookie year, over 900 yards. In the offseason, if you tuned in, I shed a light on him leaving 300 yards or so out there, which was understandable to me. That's what rookies kind of do. And it kind of takes time to be on the same page as Russell Wilson. That mobility, a little backyard football. Look, after a month, he's tied with 403 yards. That's a league high, tied with Stefan Diggs. He's got over 90 yards in two games, over 100 yards in the other two, three TDs, and really should have had five. We won't go there. You know, a young player learning, so to speak. You know, he, get, he gifted away a TD two weeks ago uh, and got tackled at the one this past weekend. Metcalf, he took it to rainy defensive player of the year, Stephon Gilmore. He hasn't faced another top corner like that, but he is a large part of the let Russ cook campaign for MVP. Not that I think his 25.2 yards per catch is sustainable. But this guy's going off. He's, he's only getting four catches a game right now. I do expect that number to go up easily. He's getting six to eight targets every week. Teams, they can't ignore Tyler Lockett. They can't ignore Chris Carson or anything that Russell Wilson does. Metcalf, he's going to still do his thing. The defense for Seattle, they're not special. They bend a whole lot. They do step up in the turnover category, second in the NFL with eight. It's a perfect setup when you look at Metcalf from the defense giving up the 13th most points to them getting the second most turnovers to his skill set, just being a monster. We've seen him shed a tackle to break out for 32 yards with some yak. We've seen him catch a spiral from Russ over 40 yards down the field. And of course the quarterback, the situation. I'm glad I have DK Metcalf in fantasy again. 
Seahawks fans should be the happiest. DK is a monster and just might be my favorite receiver in the game, Drew. Yeah, man, all, all I can think about is <laughs> uh, the reports of him walking into that draft room with his shirt off. I mean, this guy, um, definitely a crowd favorite, definitely um, already uh, spotlighting his own name in the community, locker room favorite. Uh, this guy's just a physical freak. One of the biggest performances we've ever seen against Stephon Gilmore. Like you said, reigning defensive player of the year. They were going right at him. They were not afraid, um, and he showed I mean, even in even in uh, blocking, you know, they, he took it. Even the ball, the ball wasn't going his way. He was making it a point to make Stephon Gilmore realize that I'm here to stay. I'm here for the challenge, and I'm not afraid of you. So even if it wasn't a pass play, him winning most of those plays, he was definitely uh, taking it to him, <laughs> run blocking too. And, and he's no pushover. I mean, that's one of the biggest, strongest, fastest guys in the league. Stephon Gilmore definitely had his hands full, and he had a rough night. So. Uh, love DK Mac- Metcalf going forward. Obviously, almost everybody works with Russell Wilson. He's super accurate, and he could throw the ball deep um, better than almost any quarterback out there. So definitely on board with uh, DK Metcalf. But uh, my guy is your guy, man. Um, third guy I have is Mr. Carson Wentz. <laughs> oh. I mean, as crazy as Philly football is, man. I mean, they were calling for this guy's job in week <laughs> three. A little bit quiet in week two, but it was there, man. The chirping was loud. They were calling for Jalen Hurts. They were calling for almost anything to get Carson Wentz out of there. Trades, nonsense, man. A bunch of nonsense. Um, Some of the dumbest things that I've ever heard. I I mean, people just forget what he did in 2019. I mean, I'll go back and just name off. As far as starters, you had starting running backs missing 11 games. Receivers, 14 games. Um, Offensive tackles, a game. Offensive uh, or Offensive tackles, four games total. Um, middle linebackers, four games. Outside linebackers, seven games. I mean, the list goes on and on, especially defensively. You're talking about a guy that's always playing catch-up football. It happened again in 2020. Playoff games without a starter. I mean, people forget his jersey sales went up like 70% because of how he carried this team last year. I mean, he came into that playoff game without a starting running back, three starting receivers, a corner was out, a D tackle was out, an all pro tight end and tackle was out. It was insane. And now we get to 2020. He's struggling a little bit with some of the same issues and we're going to call for his job. That's just, you guys got to just take a chill pill, watch the games, look at what they're dealt. And he's doing things that we judge other players for or praise other players for jets fans. They always back Sam Darnold. Oh, well, if, if he had the weapons, you know, I think you'd be a lot better what happened to Wentz's weapons? You know, we always talk about, oh, it's not Brady's fault. You know, if he if he had better weapons or higher draft picks, why can't we have that support for Carson Wentz? It's always two sides of the story. I mean, out of the 12 teams giving up more points than the Eagles this year, only two of them have a winning record. We talked about Seattle going crazy. And then we talked about Cleveland, who They've beaten a rookie, Joe Burrow, in his first primetime game. They beat Dwayne Haskins, and then they beat a Dallas team giving up free points to everybody, the worst team against points allowed in the league. I mean, at Washington, Carson Wentz versus arguably the best front seven in the league right now. Wentz had nobody. His whole team was hurt, and the rest of the team was dropping like flies. They led that game 80% of the game, and then Philly defense just gave up 27 points to Dwayne Haskins. Star players on offense, a backup tight end, and undrafted Greg Ward. I mean, let's get real. Running the ball, Boston Scott, Corey Clement. Okay, so we go against the Rams game. They were only down five points twice, including in the fourth quarter. That Rams are a number five offense coming into that game. Philadelphia's defense gave up 37 points. Deshaun Jackson couldn't get open until the third quarter. Goddard forgot how to catch. And then you face Cincinnati and Joe Burrow. Joe Burrow is having one of the best rookie quarterback seasons we've seen in NFL history. Cincinnati's pass defense, they're no joke. They're number six against yards right now, but not just that. Sixth best in completion percentage for opposing quarterbacks and fifth best in passer rating for opponent quarterbacks. So they're not a joke there. Other teams have struggled too. It's not just Carson Wentz. Their star was undrafted, 
Greg Ward, again, offensively for that team. They had nobody else. And then going up against San Francisco, in San Francisco, <laughs> you had Travis Fulgham making the game-winning catch, a sixth-round draft choice, probably the game winner right before the pick six. And then you had, again, highlights from Greg Ward and Richard Rodgers. I mean, who are these guys? It's all Carson Wentz. Back him up a little bit. Wow, you took me off guard with that, but it feels pretty good for someone outside of Eagles Nation. Even though I know you like him, don't get me wrong, but your your main squad is the Rams. To to actually see that and to actually dive in and be like, all right, what's what? I love it, Drew. Thank you, man. Uh, I will add, Wentz. I, I viewed that tie as a positive. That should have been an L, but. He had a chance if Wentz, you know, is there mentally. He made a few really sharp throws, some some throws not so great. It, there's a psyche to it. Things aren't perfect. You're kind of surrounded with chaos. You're going through mud. It's going to have a domino effect in a, and get in your own head. So, yeah, that does result in some extra missed throws. I understand that when I'm evaluating any quarterback in the league and – he goes to San Francisco. I know they were on a backup quarterback, but that defense is still good. No Nick Bosa, but they were still good before they drafted Bosa. No Richard Sherman. Look, I what is what it is. Everybody's going through injuries. It's just ridiculous the amount that are going on in, on some teams. I'm not saying Philly's the only team, but they're one of the teams that's probably top five as far as being decimated. He is without seven of his nine top targets that they had on the depth chart entering the season. He's only had two offensive linemen in the lineup consistently. That's just tough for any quarterback. He goes, he makes some big time plays in Cincy. He runs the ball more against San Francisco. He runs the ball more. He's saying F it. I'm just going to play some ball. If I'm going to win, or if I'm going to lose, no matter who's around me, I just got to be me. And so that's what I love the most about what he's done is he's now just playing ball through the good and the bad. So I'm glad you brought him up, man. Stock down. My first stock down here. It kind of pains me because I've been a fan of the head coach that just got relieved of his duties. He was also GM and of this team, the Houston Texans. Maybe they're going, maybe they're trying to save their season after an 0-4 start. Bill O'Brien out. I defended his off season, his past success, reaching three of the fat past four postseasons with different quarterbacks. It wasn't just Deshaun Watson. Weeks one through four, they played Kansas City, Baltimore, Pittsburgh, and Minnesota. We should have expected 0-2, but when you keep making the playoffs, the goals shift to beating those teams in your conference, like the Chiefs, the Ravens, and the Steelers. I get it. You don't just want to make the playoffs when you hit a certain point. Now it's about getting to the next level. So that's probably what came into that decision is that, they didn't think they were improved to the point of beating those teams down the road if they couldn't hang early on. Not that I agree with it, but I do see how goals can shift for a franchise like that. Uh, you know, you expect to make a deep playoff run. Also, look, the Steelers, they're a playoff caliber team that just missed it by a game last year without their quarterback. Most of us think Pittsburgh's playoff bound again. Minnesota made the postseason last year, too. I know they were winless, but that means they were just as desperate as the Texans for a win. They happened to get it. When you look at the Texans, O'Brien being offensive oriented, they scored 20, 16, 21, and 23. It hasn't been a hot start, to say the least, and he's gone. But the bigger issue, the next guy in line to become interim head coach, Romeo Cornell, he's the defensive coordinator, but check this out. Points allowed, 34, 33, 28, and 31. That seems counterproductive to me. So if you're going to name someone interim, don't recycle another coach 
you know, to, to get you through the storm, so to speak. Maybe you're a team that's in that position. Sure. I don't see that. They should be elevating the next offensive mind, so to speak, like Tim Kelly. He's their OC and quarterback coach. He spent two years with O'Brien at Penn State. The past seven years with him in Houston, he actually played defensive tackle uh, back when he was a player. So he probably knows a little bit about that side of the ball too, I'm sure. I'm not an advocate of firing everybody, but Cornell staying doesn't make any sense to me because that's the bigger issue with Houston. What do you think? Yeah, it was, it was questionable. I understand it. it. There's just too many questions out there. Obviously, he was taking heat um, off season for the trade already. And then to see the offense struggle like this, especially – the tandem of quarterback to receiving to receiving threats didn't bode well, probably obviously the lack of offensive points. And it's not just that there was a wide margin. The point differential was just a little bit too much. So I, I get it. They were frustrated at the same time to balance it out. It was more of a scapegoat kind of thing. It, it was either him or Cornell. And I mean, why not just out the guy that's been a little bit more deflective in the media who knows? I think Bill O'Brien will easily get uh, another gig sooner than later. Um, but yeah, I, something had to change. It just didn't seem like things were clicking. Obviously, a 75% playoff rate the past four years. But uh, I mean, the NFL, they have no patience, man. It's, it's either now or never. They've definitely shown that. Not this team specifically, but I think they gave him enough chances to get over the hump. I think he was close. Uh, I just think the patience kind of ran out in Houston. So I, I get it. I just wouldn't agree at this point of the season. Like you said, with the uh, with the opposing teams that they've played, I mean, you would have had to expect maybe two wins. I think even two wins would have been optimistic for the team and their new weapons, especially losing their biggest plug on defense, DJ Reader, to stop the run. And now they're bleeding rushing yards against every team. So it's kind of hard to factor in, but I mean, something had to change. I think they more or less just wanted to make a big splash, taking out the head coach than just a positional coach or a defensive coordinator. So I get it just maybe a little bit too premature for me, but uh, I mean, along with him, I think most likely the next coach fired is, is Dan Quinn. And I want to keep beating on this drum until it actually happens, but this is the third year in a row that with Matt Ryan healthy and Dan Quinn at head coach, this team has won one or fewer games in the first four weeks. 31st in total yards defensively, 31st in points allowed defensively, and it's not looking better at all. Their secondary is dropping like flies to injuries or setting through sitting through quarantine because of COVID, but – they're also the worst against passer rating too. So quarterbacks are having the best field day against this Atlanta Falcons team. I mean, it's just all bad. I don't know where else this team is going to go. Like I said, a couple weeks ago, it already looks like they lost the locker room to me in the locker room. A lot of the injuries questionable or doubtful. I feel like that has to do with wanting to be on the field too. So with all of these players being out, I think that kind of plays into the fact that maybe they just don't believe in what this defense or what this coach is preaching. You be, you can't be giving up that many points, especially when you're a defensive coach. This is your side of the field that you should be controlling, and it's not holding up to par. And this is not just this year. It's been the past three years. So, yes, they've been finishing strong. But, again, like the Bill O'Brien situation – how long are they going to wait? How long is this patience going to last before it runs out? I don't think it's going to last too much longer. Obviously, there's a couple of tough games coming up, but as soon as they hit a bye week or maybe one of the worst losses they've suffered in franchise history, I don't know. It shouldn't take that much, but I just don't see anything as an upward trend. You got Julio Jones hurt. I mean, think about this. Julio Jones is going to be 32 in a couple months. He's already shown this year that Maybe it's either the coaching staff or the training staff putting them back in too early, or maybe he's kind of going through a hard few years in the NFL. I mean, this guy has been a physical phenomenon. Maybe he's kind of pushed it to the edge. He's always been a target leader. He's always been a catch reception leader. He's always been a yardage leader. 
Um, so maybe his tires are running out at the same time. Whoever's throwing him the ball, Matt Ryan's going to be 36 by the end of the year next year. I don't know if it's time to make changes or mix things up, but it doesn't really look good for the Falcons. Those are some excellent points. I thought not this year, but the following year, it would be the Roddy White to Julio Jones type of situation with Julio this time being the veteran, handing that thing off to Calvin Ridley. You might be right. It might be this year. It's tough, man. I really think, I really think Matt Ryan is underrated. If put it this way, if Matt Ryan had been on the Patriots instead of Tom Brady, I think they reap similar success. That might be debatable. Of course it's debatable. I I just really like Matt Ryan. It it's tough to be a quarterback every single year. I know he's had Julio. Don't get me wrong. Some years you don't have the line. Some years you don't have the rushing. Some years you don't have a second target to step up. Some years you don't have a defense. Hey, it comes with the position. I get it. I'm a little bummed. You're right. They're in their thirties, man. <laughs> and ATL, you, you have a good reason to press that panic button here with your stock down. I'm going to shift real quick. Atlanta, maybe they look into someone that's a stabilizer, you know, like a Jason Garrett. I know New York, the giants aren't, the greatest offense right now, but I actually really respect what Garrett did in Dallas more than most. And I thought it was just a tough, a tough situation for Mike McCarthy to come into. And my stock down is this team, the Dallas Cowboys, the other team in Texas. They're, they're far from sounding off the alarm because of their division. They're one in three, only half game behind first. Losses to the Rams and Seahawks, that's not anything to be ashamed of, to be honest. But it is a measuring stick, that barometer game that I kind of bring up often. You know, they played both of those teams in recent postseasons, the Rams and the Seahawks. And so those are games that kind of matter early on. NFC opponents didn't get those dubs. But again, they're not losses to be ashamed of. You know, it, it wasn't a good sign playing the aforementioned Falcons, they had to come back and they pretty much won because they didn't know onside kick rules. So how worried should we be? You know, when, when you're grading them individually, I say you should be absolutely worried about Dallas. You look at the division, they're going to be in it till the end, even if they don't make it. Uh, But that Atlanta, it was a win. Nonetheless, Cleveland, they just handed it to them. They went up 41 to 14 after three quarters of play. They made the scoreboard, meaning Dallas, look interesting with 24 points in the final frame. It's something a lot of us are used to, though, them putting up points and yards, playing from behind. Dak Prescott, Ezekiel Elliott, last weekend, they both coughed up the ball three times combined. They both coughed it up in prime field position. That led to 14 points for the Browns. Then they turned the ball over on downs in the second half, a late red zone interception as well. The points allowed cannot solely fall on the Cowboys defense. These blunders equated to a 24 point swing overall. I don't need to see anything further from Kellen Moore going up 14 to seven after the first and Ezekiel Elliott finishes with 12 carries. Don't give me this playing from behind excuse. The Dallas Cowboys made the postseason and rolled out a respectable defense when they ran the damn ball. I highly question Mike McCarthy and his ability to improve this offense. Everyone just wanted to move on from Jason Garrett. Just fatigue. The grass isn't always greener, man. If you're not going to use Zeke, Trade him for defenders and draft picks that you desperately need. Just pass the ball all day. Move on from Zeke. Throw in Tony Pollard, who doesn't cost that pretty penny. Don't pay all that for Zeke. If that's the case, rest of the year, expect much of the same from all NFC East teams. But we're focusing on Dallas here. Whatever you are used to watching them do, expect that. Highs against weaker teams, 
Lowe's against better teams. That one game they show up and upset someone. That one game they show up and allow a team to upset them. That's the Dallas Cowboys. I view Josh Allen and Russell Wilson ranking top three in passing yards as a positive. Maybe down the road, I can view that as a positive where Dak Prescott leads the league in yards right now in that type of light. I can't view that this way right now. There's a reason he's on the franchise tag. This is the same old Cowboys post Jason Garrett. I had the same team, man. Yeah. Dallas, uh, can't say enough, but uh, they had an identity. They had a near winning, consistent winning, balanced winning, playoff hopeful kind of winning strategy. Um, but that strategy, strategy at least was an identity. It was feed Zeke, let him eat. And then you got Dak Prescott, who's great on play action with great enough receivers on the outside to win against one-on-one coverage. They're going completely opposite from the second half of last year into this year. And it's depleting them. I mean, you have one of the worst defenses in the league, the worst in total yards, actually. Second worst against the run, and they're the worst team against points allowed. Also, they're the worst against or in the turnover battle. So they just keep coughing up the ball. They never take it away. And quarterbacks love playing this defense. They do not make any quarterbacks uncomfortable. They, the quarterbacks that they're facing – have the third best quarterback rating against the Dallas defense. They're the third worst on third downs, fourth most penalties in the league. You just don't see too much a positive from this team. That's actually a pretty interesting take there to, to let Z go, especially if you're not going to use him. Um, I, I just don't know. They lost their identity. Their identity is now play from behind, win with miracles, and just let the other team do whatever they want on offense. And obviously it's not a winning strategy for me. I look at the rest of the schedule, a lot of questions for me. I mean, I'm giving them W's, but confidently I could only give them about four giants. I give them a win Arizona. That's a loss in Washington. We're getting to the cold season now in Washington. That's a questionable win at Philly. That's a loss. Pittsburgh. That's a loss. In Minnesota, that's a loss. Home against Washington, who knows, man. If Dwayne Haskins improves, I'll give him a win, but that's still a question mark with that win. At Baltimore, no way. At Cincy, I think Burrow is going to be showing us complete rework with this offense and defense. Um, Not so bad against quarterbacks. I think that's a very questionable win in Cincy. Again, East Coast, cold weather. That's a dome team that they're put, that they are um, in Dallas, and then you have San Francisco. That's a loss. Philly. That's a loss. Late in the year, we know Philly can survive, and put put offensive production on the field at the New York Giants for the last game. Again, that's late in the season. Football, cold weather teams outside. I'm giving them a questionable win there, but those are all games on the road that I could see them losing with this identity of football. It's not working, and to, uh, to match that, I have as my third stock falling is Ezekiel Elliott. He was one of my favorite running backs. Obviously, me as an Ohio State fan, but this year he has had career lows in attempts per game, yards per carry, rush yards total through the first four games, and he's matched his lowest touchdown rate in the first four games as well. Check this out. His longest runs so far have been 18 yards, 14, 11, and 10. They're just not feeding him the ball, or at times he just doesn't look the same. So I don't think that's a crazy situation to let that fat contract go in exchange for defensive players. If you really think you have some kind of pedigree to win this year, and by win I mean make a playoff run at least for the seventh seed i think that was kind of built for a dallas team or a rams team this year but the rams actually look like they're going to be competitive the dallas team yeah they they make highlight plays but you can't seriously think of them as a contender being the worst team in turnover battle that's that's a winning recipe 
We've seen that plenty of times. The best teams in the playoffs have the best turnover percentage, and it's definitely not this team. I mean, you're looking at Zeke getting 22 carries in the first two games, weeks one and two, but week three against Seattle, they were only down by more than one score for a total of nine minutes, and they stopped running the ball. And again, it's Cleveland. They just gave up 12 total carries. It's one or the other. Zeke is just not the same. They don't believe him, or they're just in over their heads just trying to play catch-up all day long for no reason. We saw the Rams succeed in a 25-point comeback game running the football. And you guys have Ezekiel Elliott, and you're not going to give him the rock? What What's going on? Like I said, I've seen enough of Kellen Moore. And I keep telling people, we'll stick to the NFC East since we spoke about both of these teams, Eagles and Cowboys. Their offensive lines are not the same. They are not the same. That's another factor. Dallas is so frustrating to watch because they had that recipe for success that helped Dak Prescott out of play action, that helped the defense stay on the sideline for the most part, come in super fresh and very limited. They went from a historically terrible defense when Zeke and Dak just came into the league to – a respectable defense making the playoffs. That That's one of the most frustrating teams to watch is, is the Dallas Cowboys. I hear you on Zeke. A lot of people are feeling that way. I, I think it's the sum of the parts. I, I will take Zeke any day over any offensive player on that team. That's just me. I may be in the minority. I'm not absolutely high on building around Amari Cooper. That's probably why, but – I, I get I get the concerns when, when Zeke is part of that offense and that offense is struggling and falling from behind and having to pull these, I guess, you know, garbage stats that make all the fantasy owners happy. It, it's not reality football. It's not making the Jones happy upstairs. I will stick in the backfield for my third stock down. This may tick off a lot of people. Maybe even you, I'm not sure. We'll find out. Rookie running backs is who I have a bone to pick with. Supposedly the plug and play position of the offense. We're seeing some challenging transitions right now, perhaps because of a shortened off season. Still, J.K. Dobbins, 21 touches in four games. Mark Ingram may be there, but Alvin Kamara forced the issue, knocked him out of town after two seasons. The same seems likely here simply because of age and wear and tear. They got a, they got a great O line that runs as much as anybody and the luxury of a running quarterback. One of the best in NFL history, if not the best already, that kind of depends. Dobbins hasn't really taken advantage of that. Jonathan Taylor. He's touched the ball between 14 and 28 times in every game. He was my favorite back in the draft class. But I can't say he's been impressive. In short time, it was evident that the injured Marlon Mack was the better back for 2020. Even if the Paso in Indy is underwhelming, they're kind of banged up. Philip Rivers is looking old. The line is great, and he's getting the volume, and the defense has been great, as you mentioned earlier. He's going to continue to get those little touches and the volume and all that, all the opportunities. So far after a month, I haven't seen it out of Dobbins and Taylor. And I can even I can even throw Clyde Edwards Hilaire in that. He's in the ideal situation. The thing is, since week one, his debut, he has not been efficient. And we've had a month to watch. He's the guy there, no question. He has that role. He'll have countless chances to face a bare bones box. They won't be stacked, they won't be loaded, thanks to Pat Mahomes and that offense all those weapons running those routes. Hilaire's going to get his chance just like the just like Jonathan Taylor. After a month, I didn't see much to be excited about. Joshua Kelly, he's running for 3.3 yards per carry right now. But hey, he's got a golden opportunity while Austin Eckler is on the sidelines, but that's if he can fend off Justin Jackson who just returned from his injury. Anthony McFarland for the Steelers, he looked good in his one game so far. One game, but he did look good. Not much going on for Zach Moss, DeAndre Swift, A.J. Dillon, and Cam Akers. 
it's still early. I'm not one of those that jumps to conclusion, but after a month of football, this is why I have rookie running back stock down. I know they have a dozen games left, a whole season in front of us. At this point in time, this is how I'm grading the rookie group of running backs because y'all say they're plug and play and it's easy and not to pay these guys. It's my favorite position, so I'm going to be hard on it and hard on you diehards for talking that way. I'm not going to gloss over it, not this position, and I'm not giving them a slide due, due to a shortened off season. I'm seeing Justin Herbert play well. I'm seeing Joe Burrow play well. These running backs should be playing a lot better than they are, and they're not seeing the field right now. You hate me for that, Drew? No, definitely not. I, I get what you're saying, but I think given the sample size, it's hard to say that they're worth the e- either the first or the high second round pick or some of the running backs late second and early third. But I think if given extra time, maybe the second quarter of this league, I, I feel like it's it's undeniable the talent for J.K. Dobbins. It's undeniable the talent for Clyde edwards Lair, and the same goes for the undeniable talent for Jonathan Taylor, especially when all three offensive lines are not terrible. It's going to be an improvement. I, I don't see any issues moving forward. If given the same opportunity, we're talking at least 12 to 18 touches per game. I think eventually when it comes through, now keep in mind, there were restrictions in the offseason of who can work out with who. Didn't really seem like quarterbacks and their receivers were following the rules you saw. You know, a lot of seven on seven, a lot of hidden videos. And I say hidden because obviously they wanted to prove that they were still working out for the fans and for whoever else they wanted on the roster. But it was happening. It was hard to get the O lineman, the quarterback, if you had a fullback, the fullback on the roster and these running backs, especially if you're coming into the team like uh, J.K. Dobbins case, third probably on the depth chart, Jonathan Taylor's case second or third on the depth chart. So they didn't really have the same opportunity for these quarterbacks to under the radar practice with the wide receivers in in the seven on seven makeshift um, practice leagues. They needed that O line and they needed the other pieces to fully get the grasp on the playbook. So I don't really knock it too much there. You're right. They should be a little bit better as far as what they're putting on the field. But I think given the opportunity, we've obviously seen the Ravens splitting a lot of different carries. Gus Edwards still in the mix. Obviously, Lamar Jackson keeps the rock a lot more than any other quarterback in the league. And then you have Taylor, who kind of started as a plug and play, maybe every second or third rotation, obviously with injury. I think they'll still be more balanced with Naheem Hines until Taylor gets more involved in the offense or at least more consistent or confident. And then Clyde Edwards, he definitely looks like the guy. I think he'll pick it up. He was actually my favorite running back coming into this draft class. I think out of those three specifically, and maybe DeAndre Swift, for the rest of the year, as long as they get consistent with those 12 to 18 touches, I think they'll be just fine. And I hear you. And I hear you. But I'm going to be a tough grader because you know how it goes, man. Diehard fans or casual fans, which – there's no problem being casual, just as long as you act that way. That's cool, you know. But And then fantasy players, they all talk that smack about the running back position. It, it ain't so easy breezy. So, all right, diehards, that's going to do it for our stock up, stock down. We'd love to hear what you got to say about your, your stocks up and down, whether it's a coach, player, or a team. Bring it. We're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. Check it out. And if you want us to dive more into something, something that we touched upon, let us know. We will. We put in the homework so you don't have to. And uh, all right. We'll see you. We'll see you next time.